My presentation today is on accurately determining the RF power in your signal. Uh, so it's, it's a lot about power detectors today. So the idea behind a power detector is quite a simple function. Uh, the function is you're putting an RF signal in and you're getting a voltage out. As the signal gets larger or smaller, your output voltage is going to change over a certain dynamic range. So it's like an RF power meter in a chip. Now, in order to be able to get an accurate signal, I guess to start with, uh, power detectors are used in, in many different applications. But one, of them, one of the main applications is used is to be able to determine the power of a, of, a, of a high power amplifier. So you have a high power amplifier, it's a very expensive unit, and FCC controls how much power you can actually put into the air. So what, what people do is they measure that output power, and the more accurate they can measure the output power, the actually more power they can send into the air. So if, if say, the FCC uh, says maximum you can put out one watt, and their power detector and everything changes over temperature, then they have to back off that power detector to make sure that they never send more than one watt power into the air. So you, you want a fairly uh, you want a, a fairly accurate power detector so that you can send as much power as possible in the air because that's going to help your link budget. Now, in order to accurately measure the output power, you have to know what you're measuring. The more you know about what you're measuring, the more accurate you can be. Past technologies include diodes, chalky diodes, to be able to determine what your what your output power is and what your power amplifier, whatever else you're measuring at the time. Uh, this is a typical transfer function of a chalky diode. Uh, you can see that uh, the different colors represent different temperatures. So shocky dials tend to vary quite a bit in the temperature. Uh, you also have issues, for example, harmonics getting back into your system, which could cause you issues with spurs and with FCC and, and all sorts of things like that. So you have, you have a lot of things to be able to worry about with the shocky dial, though they can be good for, for some applications. Now, ADI a, a while back came up with what we call a, a log detector. Log detectors are linear in DD instead of linear in volts per volt. The, uh, the Shockey diode solution is linear in volts per volt instead of linear in DD. So your dynamic range is less and your temperature performance varies by quite a bit. So your, your log detector is taking care of many of those attributes because the log detector is linear in DD instead of linear in volts per volt. You have a very wide dynamic range and the temperature performance of log detectors tends to be around plus or minus a half DB from minus 45 to plus 85, even to plus 125. Your latest log detectors actually go up to plus 125 degrees C. Now, depending on what your signal is, either a linear in volts per volt or a linear in dB part may be better for the application. Uh, for example, a, an HPA that isn't changing a lot of power is going to be at the high power point. And there's a lot of variability. In other words, if you change your signal by a little bit, you get a lot of variation in a linear in volts per volt part. If you get a lot of variation linear in volts per volt part, you're able to get a lot of resolution without having a lot of bits on your, on your ADC. But as you get to wider and wider dynamic range, there's less and less change for a change in power level, which basically means you need to use more bits as you, as you go out and use a linear type part. When linear and DB part, it's a constant change per dB when you put in a lot of power or a little bit of power. It's constant over that full range. 
So it's much easier to linearize, it's much easier to be able to choose what specific ADC you need for the application. Now, when I say that you have to know what your signal is in order to be able to measure it, a lot of people will be measuring pulse type signals. Pulse type signals are difficult to measure because they are moving very fast. And often you want to know when the pulse is there, and you also may want to know what the, what the low power level is on, on your pulse itself. And so you have to really follow the input. Uh, log detectors are very fast. Uh, a lot of our log detectors, you can get the full dynamic range in about six nanoseconds. So they're very fast. And you can follow a pulse type signal, most pulse type signals, very quickly. Uh, and they, they have that advantage. And they also are linear in DB, so you can get a good dynamic range to be able to see between your max power and your min power on your, on your log detector. <laughs> now, often people are measuring signals that will change in peak to average value. Uh, for example, LTE has the ability to be able to change very widely in peak to average value. The worst that I've came up with so far is actually 4 carrier wideband CDMA. Without crest factor reduction, 4 carrier wideband CDMA, you can have peak to average value that goes up to almost 14 dB, and you can go down as low as about 4 dB if you minimum peak to average value. And the problem is, the FCC they specify average power. You can't go over a certain amount of average power. So if you're putting in a signal, and let's say you have a press factor of plus 7 dBm, and all of a sudden you change your modulation going into it, and you go into a press factor of 4 dBm, your log detectors and your, uh, your uh, diode detectors are going to actually change value even though your average power is staying the same. So when you change peak to average value, your output from the power detector changes even though your average power is the same. An example of that is right here in this graph right, right here. So this is a uh, this is a log detector. And we're changing from various different, uh, different modulation waveforms. We're going all the way from CW to 4 carrier white band CDMA. And you can see that even though the average power is the same, the output from the power detector changes. It's even worse for a, for a uh, diode tech detector. Um, so the output changes. But in a RMS detector, it will not change when your peak to average value changes. And that's the key behind RMS power detectors. So, RMS power detectors have some things that aren't as good. For example, RMS power detectors are not as fast as log detectors. You just can't change very quickly over pulse type signals. Now you have signals like uh, YMAX. It's been a while since YMAX has been popular. YMAX both changes peak to average value and it can be a pulse type signal. So you have to do some trade-offs. Uh, and actually most of our RMS power detectors are fast enough to be able to follow a YMAX signal. And so you get a combination to all of them. But that, that's why RMS power detectors are so effective. RMS power detectors are so effective because even though you change peak to average value, your output isn't changed. If your output peak to average value isn't changing and it's just high, then actually the best type of part to get is a log detector. Because a log detector is faster and you're going to calibrate initially to be able to take care of the peak to average value, initial peak to average value that you have in the particular log detector. So you don't actually need an RMS detector if all you have is high crest factor. You only need the RMS detector if you have a change in peak to average value. And there's actually two types of RMS power detectors. There's one part, one type of parts, which is in linear impulse control. This is similar to your uh, to diode detectors where it's linear impulse control. Uh, the difference is it also has the RMSing ability included in it. So if the peak to average value changes, there's very minimal change in your output power along with those peak to average value uh, changes. 
Uh, this gives you an example of, of say, a linear and multiple part and a linear and BB part. Over here on this plot, you're going to see the output of the linear and multiple part. This is about 35 parts, and it comes from what we call a skew lot, where we've taken the, the lot and we've skewed it from one end of the process to the other end of the process. To be able to give you an idea of the maximum variation that we're going to get over the full, uh, over the full lot in high production of that volume. The, the red signal here is plus 85 degrees Celsius, and the blue here is minus 40, uh, minus 40 degrees Celsius. And you can tell at the higher power levels here, the variation is almost plus or minus 0.1 dB variation of the skew lot of material. So it has the ability to be able to have very accurate high power detection. Um, especially at the higher power levels where there's a lot of change. There's a lot of change in the slope for the change in output uh, power. Uh, and it gives you a very good temperature performance and a lot of accuracy. Now as you get lower and lower in power level, the further and further on this further and further on this slope that you're not changing as much as the power level, you also get more variation in the temperature. Now, you can actually calibrate a lot of this out, because if you see the black line, the black line is real temperature, you can calibrate a lot of it out, but you're not going to get rid of a lot of the temperature variation at the lower power levels. Uh, another type of RMS power detector are the ones that are linear in DB. Uh, this gives you a, an idea of the architecture that you have for a linear and DB RMS power detector. Uh, it's based on a, on a VGA type uh, type output, which also gives you maybe a little bit slower loop, uh, which is why RMS power detectors are not that not that fast. This gives you an idea of uh, the performance of a typical RMS power detector. This is the ADL 5906. Uh, it works up to, up to 10 gigahertz. Uh, it has about 60 dB dynamic range. Uh, you put in all sorts of different uh, signals here. So you can see that we put in CW all the way from CW to 4 carry wideband CDMA or LTE. And the variation. Uh, is very, very linear with the change in, uh, in different risk factors for those different signals. <laughs> well, along with, uh, along with single power detectors, we also do dual power detectors. So for dual tower power detectors, they would be used in an application when you're looking for, say, the forward and the reverse power level. Uh, out of the PA. The PA is a very expensive uh, component, and return power to that PA can destroy the PA. So if you use a, a directional coupler, you can use a dual power detector, and the dual power detector will detect the forward and the reverse power. Uh, along with that, though, you can actually get the visual output. Because some of the outputs on the dual power detectors uh, give you the difference between forward and reverse. And uh, one of the good things about that is it, it subtracts out the temperature variation of forward and reverse because it's taking the difference between them. So it actually, uh, it actually takes out the temperature variation because you have two parts here on the same line very close to each other. They are very close to the same, uh, close to the same drift of temperature. And then you subtract the output, you're basically subtracting out the, the temperature uh, variation on that as well. So it gives you the power for the forward, the power for the reverse, and it gives you the actual visual as well using these, uh, these dual power detectors. We have dual power detectors with both log and RMS uh, detection. A different type of signal that you may want to try to detect is the envelope. There's uh, new technology that's going on and, and new ways of uh, getting more efficiency out of your PA. And one of those new ways is called envelope tracking. Often some customers may not have access to that envelope in digital land. And so we have a part that's actually able to follow the envelope of your signal. 
and you're able to extract that info to be able to adjust the bias on your final uh, final stage PA based on the envelope level of your signals going into it. So the, uh, the part to be able to do that is the ADL5511. ADL5511 has an RMS output that can tell the average power, it won't change the peak and average value. But it also has an envelope output that you can pipe back in and control the bias of the final stage PA to be able to do envelope tracking type applications. So as a summary, uh, for our power detectors, initially you had discrete diode detectors that were linear and close components. But what analog devices did is we came up with integrated power detectors. With those integrated power detectors, you have the choice of log amps, RMS power detectors that are linear and volts per volt, RMS power detectors that are linear and AD, and envelope tracking. Uh, in the log amps and the RMS linear DB, you have both symbols and rules to be able to meet any type of power detection capability. So, we have the ability to be able to measure accuracy any type of signal that, that you have in your system. Be able to do that to a very fine accuracy in your own temperature. Uh, Lee through Richardson uh, have what's called an RF detector surfboard. Uh, this particular part includes, there's a demonstration of it right there, and that's something that you can get from Richardson. Uh, it includes the ADL5902, which is a uh, 9 gigahertz RMS detector, it's a single detector. Uh, it also includes the ADL5513, which is an RMS detector with the envelope detector. And it includes the ADL5511, which is a uh, uh, RMS power envelope. Sorry, the, the 5511 is the RMS envelope, but the 5513 is the uh, 1 to 4 gigahertz. Uh, ADDB 9 inch log detector. So it includes all three of those uh, power detectors and one board, and you can use any one of your devices. It gives you the opportunity to get a range of power detectors in, in one board. Uh, this is uh, an idea of how you can get it, but we showed you that already. And if you stop by our booth, you can see a recently announced part uh, that, we, that we announced just a day or two ago, specifically for the NTC show, which is a power detector that works up to 40 gigahertz. It's our first, uh, it's our first microwave power detector um, that we've done. I'm quite happy to take any questions to you. That's it. I appreciate your time.